In this example, we're going to look at a single story, single bay portal frame that is a moment resisting frame, rigid joints. This one also has fixed ends at the end, 10 foot width, 10 foot height, and um, although it has a gravity load of 3 kips per foot applied to the beam, we're going to focus only on the 10 kip lateral load in this lateral load analysis. There's a companion video that looks at separately the gravity load effects on this portal frame. Right now, along the way, as we try to figure out how we might uh, rationally come a, uh, about a, an approximate analysis and the effects of what's going on here, uh, the extreme view of things might be helpful and instructive. For instance, although we can certainly anticipate that correctly that this frame due to this lateral load is going to want to sort of skew over or shear over that we'd have, in other words, cord rotations of the members, of the, that is the columns, of about the same amount and that if we ignore axial elongation then the beam is going to do no, have no cord rotation. We know that that can't exactly work out uh, because uh, we have fixed ends and so we can't got to have some sort of bending stiffness down there that prevents just sort of that free rigid body rotation going on here. So it might make then more sense that we'd have something that would be of course tangent to the original shape or location that is. And we get a little transition going on here in both columns and then we're going to have that um, need to bend back a little bit in the other direction. This is a little rough here, but it's not so bad. So we get sort of this reverse curvature, not sort of reverse curvature, we definitely get the reverse curvature. A little hard to draw on top of the ink that is the color photograph. That's going to cause the, these joints to have rotated in this case in a counterclockwise fashion. And notice that the tangents to the, the beam curve are parallel, or maybe parallel to each other or approximately so, but yet they don't intersect. So that has to curve in some sort of a little reverse curve S shape fashion at all. Now, again, ignore the influence of the uh, distributed load there because we're not considering that effect right now. And so we'll come along and then get this in there. Let's put the curvatures in the right spot. And we get maybe something that looks beginning of that. Notice in each and every case we have inflection points here, our PIs, that are roughly in the middle. Right, so roughly, they, they kind of feel good that that's roughly where they're at. But let's again look at a couple of the extremes. What if we had um, the beam being incredibly flexible compared to the column? It offers no real uh, stiffness. And so if that was the case, then basically this little flagpole that is the column would bend up such that it might look something like this, where the inflection point has gone all the way up to the top. Whereas, what if, on the other hand, as this thing slides over, the beam is incredibly stiff relative to the column. So it slides over with no rotation. Then we're going to get this reverse curve that will end up having the inflection point smack dab in the middle. And we know from other work say the slope deflection approach or even the flexibility method that when we have that sway that to hold that in place we've got a 12 EI over L cubed shear force and the bending moment that would go with this would be 6 EI over L squared of course times delta in each case. So that's kind of interesting. We go from zero moment here effectively flexion point up at the top that's where the moment would be equal to zero whereas we have an inflection point down here about midway. So that might make you think that um, we should then maybe take an average and go somewhere in the middle of those things. And it's certainly perhaps true the way that some people 
if they believe that we have a true fixed foundation down here, that they will let the point of inflection rise up a little bit. It's more realistic to consider that we might be somewhere in the 60% uh, of the column height if we really had then a situation of a true fixed end down at the base of things. Right? But it's very hard to actually construct a fixed end support that has absolutely no rotation. So when that relaxes and you start balancing things, this inflection point on that ground story is oftentimes taken anywhere from 0.5 to 0.6 of the length of the column or say the height of the overall um, story. Right? And it, you know it just depends on who you talk to about what their approach might turn out uh, to be. And there's, uh, there's just more than one one way to do. So, let's, you know, for the heck of it, oh, how do I feel today? Because that's kind of how this goes. Um, we have a beam that has an I over L that's oops, 800 over our 10 feet. It's inches to the fourth. That's for the beam. And we have an I over the L for the column that is about 600 inches over to the fourth over 10 feet. So we have a four to three kind of relationship between the bending stiffness of the girder to the column. And how does that feel to me? Well, all right, so the column is stiffer. Sorry, <laughs> the beam is stiffer. And so we are more like the fixed fix case than we are the, uh, the flagpole case. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and use the 0.5H for the inflection point. And notice the beam, when it doesn't have distributed loads on it, it really is going to have an inflection point right at the midpoint. Some people make a big deal of that in their analysis and statement about what they're doing. Um, I don't usually. I just let the static sort of uh, control everything else for me. Um, but, you know, it's not it's not unreasonable at all to go ahead and state that and work with it. All right, so let's do a free by diagram that actually cuts through this location to help illustrate what's really happening and what's so important about this column um, assumed inflection point. And so let's see, I used a scale that 10 feet was equal to 2 inches, so 5 feet or mid column height would be just equal to 1 inch on my drawing scale. That's important to realize what's going on here so that you catch on to what's really happening. We got our lateral load of 10 kips. And so now as we look at this, right, we have truly cut right where that inflection point is. So to emphasize that, I put the little squiggles that I used to show the cut. I'll put the little dot to indicate the inflection point. And that's where we're assuming m equal to zero. So let's even articulate that assumption. Flexion point for columns or PI instead of IP at mid height and also for the beam at the middle. It's all right. You probably want me to put that in there. But we haven't cut it there so it doesn't really uh, have a big role to play yet. Right, we're going to have two lateral shears and we will have then an axial force. Right, Not hard to see which direction those have to uh, go to resist things and that they have to be equal and opposite. Right, But we don't know their value. And then we've got then the bending moment and oh but wait a minute that bending moment at that location is zero. That was the key. That's why we chose that location for the uh, for what we're doing, right? And so note what happens here. If we sum moments about one of these inflection points, let's do it on the right side, where that is a um, I don't know what to call this. We'll call this a prime, and because that's down, that's a, so we'll call it a prime. This is d, so we'll call this d prime. And if we sum moments about d prime 
look what's going to happen. We're going to have our axial force AY times 10 feet. The shears go away because they're going through this point and the axial force over here, the moments are zero and so minus 10 kips and this is 5 feet high so times 5 feet equals zero and therefore AY is equal to 5 kips. Okay, so that's interesting to note. Now, but you know we got, so we, this, the moments are zero, now we know those two, but doggone it, we don't know what happens with these two column forces. Now, if you assume the inflection point for the beam is at the midpoint, we could do something similar to here and go on and so forth, but a pretty common approach in this, what ultimately is called the portal method, is to assume something about the columns. And in this case, what we'll do, we only have two, we have two identical columns, so I would, in this case, I would assume um, the, that we have identical effects in the columns. Right, but a more general aspect of this is that we have what we're going to assume in the portal method is the relative stiffness of the columns. Right now, when we have multiple bays, we'll we'll address that in a different example. But here, since we have identical columns and we only have two, then I'm going to assume equal stiffness. And that means that the shear in the column are going to be the same for each one, right? And so now when we sum forces in the y, sorry, the x direction, then we get 2v minus the 10 kips equals 0, and v equals then, of course, half of that. Right? And that'll be then the key that releases us to be able to go do the rest of the analysis. So for instance, we've got the column on the lower part that now, of course, we know what the axial force, right, in this case that was 5 kips, we've got now this shear that gets turned around, there's no moment to draw because that moment was 0, and we have the reaction down at the bottom, that would be AX, that's obviously equal to 5 kips, and then we have the bending moment that goes with this, and so that'll be 5 kips times the 5 feet, so that has to become then 25 foot kips for that bending moment. And in this case, what happens on the lower half of the other column is going to be identical because, of course, we have the identical situation happening here. And so that's very interesting, and what that ultimately is going to mean for us is I've never touched or even had to deal with what's going on in the beam um, because instead of assuming a point of inflection for the beam I assume this relative stiffness of the columns and it wasn't even really all that of an assumption. They are identical, they do have the same kind of stiffness. So when we go to do now finally the moment diagram associated with this lateral load then we've got 25 foot kips here at the base And then up at the top, notice because I assume that the hinge was at the midpoint or the point of inflection, that makes the top portion of the column and the, the bottom the same height. So 5 kips here times this height, which is 5 foot, is going to again give us the 25, but it's going to be going in the other uh, direction. And that's going to be true for both columns. They're going to look identical in response to the sway causing the frame to deflect to the left. This is the American Designer Sign Convention approach. We draw the moment diagram on the compression side of the member. It's a little weird because it makes you think that the structure is swaying to the right when we know it's swaying to the left. That is one of the reasons why the Europeans like to draw the moment diagram on the other side 
of the member on the tension side. Right? We turn the corner with the static equilibrium and our moment diagrams are on the same side. We talked about it before. It's worth mentioning again that has to be that way otherwise we don't have equilibrium of the joint. Right? And so we will get 25 and 25 again for the beam, of course, this one on the left really is the negative 25. I broke the line just because of the way I inadvertently wrote the label for the 25 and on there. And there's your moment diagram. And note that that's going to be the, the reverse curvature. And that's exactly what we anticipated here, that we have compression on the left side of the bottom of the column, compression on the right side at the top of the column, and then bottom and then top as we go left to right in the beam and that's exactly what this moment diagram is also telling us. So we know that we've actually nailed the shape of the moment diagram. Magnitudes are all associated with our uh, the validity of our assumption about where the inflection points were.